I'd like to say welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's session, Confrontation or Cooperation, the Future of Relations Between the U.S. and Iran. We are hosting this program in partnership with the Iran Project. My name is Joe Poskin, Director of Operations at the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. I'm excited to be here with you all today for this noteworthy discussion. This will be day three of the Council's Redefining Global Learning Summit, and we will have more lively discussions and opportunities to network with your peers later today and tomorrow. So please visit our summit webpage linked in the chat for times and additional information. We were able to put on events such as this thanks in large part due to the, con the generosity of our community. If you are able to support the Council, please visit worldpittsburgh.org backslash donate or connect with Olivia via private chat. No matter the amount, your gift will have a true impact on global learning opportunities here in the Pittsburgh region. Now, I have the honor to introduce you to our moderator and guest speakers. Dr. Roxanne Farman Farmayan teaches international politics of the Middle East and North Africa at the University of Cambridge. In addition to various leadership roles at Cambridge, she is a founding member of the Polis Affiliated Center for the International Relations of the Middle East and North Africa. Professor, pa Professor Paul Piller retired in 2005 from a 28 year career in the US intelligence community in which his last position was national intelligence officer for the Near East and South Asia. He served in various roles, including chief of analytics units at the CIA covering portions of the Near East, the Persian Gulf, and South Asia. Professor Pillar also served in the National Intelligence Council as one of the original members of its analytic group. Barbara Slavin is the director of the Future of Iran Initiative and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. She is the author of Bitter Friends, Bosom Enemies, Iran, the US, and the Twisted Path to Confrontation. She is a regular commentator on US foreign policy in Iran on NPR, PBS, and C-SPAN. She also had an op-ed published in the New York Times just last week. As you can see, we have a great group of experts. We want you to be a part of the conversation, so again, please submit questions during the event using the Q&A feature. At this time, I would like to hand it over to Barbara Slavin for her introductory remarks. Please, Barbara, take it away. Sure. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me and inviting uh, two very distinguished colleagues to join in, in this conversation. Uh, talking about Iran is always timely, it seems, because there is always news. Uh, but that has been particularly the case under the Trump administration and uh, particularly the case uh, in recent years. Um, as you may know, under the Obama administration, an agreement was negotiated with Iran. It was called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, the United States, the other permanent members of the UN Security Council in Germany took part in these talks. The deal, uh, while uh, perhaps not perfect, maybe no arms control deal ever is, uh, did put curbs on Iran's nuclear program such that it would be, would be or would have been very difficult for Iran to develop enough material for a nuclear weapon until the year 2030. In return, sanctions against Iran uh, were to be lifted. Um, the Trump administration came in. Uh, President Trump campaigned against the agreement. He said it was the worst ever negotiated. He promised a better deal. Uh, he withdrew unilaterally in May of 2018 from the agreement uh, while Iran was in full compliance with it and proceeded to reimpose not only the sanctions that had been in place before, but to add more and more sanctions against Iran, essentially to declare economic war against uh, a country of 80 million people. Um, needless to say, there have been no new negotiations. There is no new and better deal. Uh, instead, we've seen an escalation of tensions in the Persian Gulf uh, that included uh, the assassination of uh, a senior general, uh, Iranian general, Qasem Soleimani in Baghdad um, in January of this year, uh, attacks on American forces in Iraq by Iran-backed militia groups, uh, attacks on tankers in the Persian Gulf and on a Saudi oil installation. Uh, and in the last couple of months, a number of explosions at various sites in Iran, sabotage of its main nuclear facility, and just last Friday, uh, the assassination of a man named Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, who had been 
uh, part of an effort to, uh, to design or develop a nuclear warhead uh, in a program that uh, essentially was uh, sidelined about 20 years ago after Iran's nuclear activities uh, were revealed. Um, why this man was killed is something we'll talk about. Who killed him? Well, uh, the Iranians say it was Israel. Pretty much everyone says it was Israel. And uh, we can talk a little bit about the motivation there. As I mentioned, the, the weapons program that this uh, man had been involved in was essentially suspended for two decades. Uh, but he was an important figure in uh, the nuclear infrastructure of Iran. And uh, we'll talk about whether that justified his, uh, his killing uh, in Tehran uh, on Friday. Um, we've also seen some other developments in recent days, the Iranian parliament, perhaps in a reaction to the killing of, of Fakhrizadeh, um, uh, passed some legislation that uh, would require Iran to increase the level of enrichment of uranium. Uh, in the last year, Iran has begun to move outside the limits of this nuclear deal in response to US sanctions, uh, but it had kept the level of enrichment fairly low. Uh, there's an isotope called U-235. You need uh, 80 to 90% concentration of it in order to make a nuclear bomb. Uh, but Iran has been uh, enriching only to about 5%. Uh, this legislation passed by parliament would require Iran to increase that level to 20% and to take other steps to reduce its cooperation with international inspectors. Uh, there is some question about whether this will ever really be implemented or whether it's just a pressure tactic to give Iran more leverage to try to get the incoming Biden administration to return to compliance with a nuclear agreement. Uh, Joe Biden has said he would return if Iran will return. Uh, and some of the speculation, uh, Joe mentioned the op-ed I wrote, but I, it's, this is not original with me, that the attack, the murder of Fakhrizadi was not so much to kill uh, someone in, still important in Iran's nuclear program, but to put a, yet another roadblock in the way of a return to diplomacy uh, on the part of the incoming Biden administration. So that's sort of the, the broad picture. Uh, clearly, US and Iran have not exactly had a good relationship since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. And Iran's differences with Israel are a big part of that, um, which we can also discuss. Uh, but I think what I'll do is, is turn to my moderating function now and uh, turn the floor over to Roxanne, who will talk a little bit about the, the domestic uh, political situation in Iran and you know whether Iran can return to compliance with this deal, whether there is a good prospect for future deals between uh, the West, between the United States and Iran, or whether the picture has changed uh, in the last four years. So Roxanne, over to you. Thank you so much, Barbara. What a fantastic review of a very complex story. And thank you very much to the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. And uh, Paul, once again, a, a real pleasure to be on a panel with you. And I have to say, I agree with you, Barbara. This is certainly an extraordinary time for Iran. Uh, as one of the reporters for a Tehran newspaper commented between now and January 20th, when uh, the president-elect Biden uh, will take over the reins, this is probably the most dangerous time in Iranian uh, US relations. I'd like to focus my comments on where we are now, and we can then talk uh, across the panel and with others uh, that are on this uh, about what might happen next. So I'd like to make four really brief uh, points. Firstly, it is very clear to everyone in Iran that they are walking a tightrope. On the one hand, they're quite understandably uh, outraged by what's happened and they want to see their country carry out some kind of retaliation. This year they've seen, as Barbara mentioned, two leading national figures assassinated by international foes. The country has been rocked by mysterious fires and explosions, a computer system meltdown, and the eerie burning of several of their ships that have been moored in the uh, ports in the Gulf. And very simply, their national pride is at stake. What's more, retaliation means deterrence. And by sitting on their hands, they feel Iran is leaving itself really unprotected and vulnerable to further attack. In any case, such attacks against any other country would have been 
very likely condemned by the Security Council, and that council has not said a word. And it would likewise be normally viewed as an act of war, justifying a harsh response of self-defense. But if Iran were to retaliate, it could dash the country's hopes, because on the other hand, more than anything, Iranians want an end to sanctions. They are exhausted by Trump's maximum pressure campaign. They're dealing with the highest levels of COVID in the Middle East. And they know if they just hang on for another seven weeks and exercise constraint and refuse to be provoked, there is a possible pot of gold lying tantalizingly ahead. The lifting of sanctions by the new Biden administration, the promise of a more uh, normal life and the chance to receive humanitarian and aid and medicine to help out with COVID. For Iranians, this is a devil's bargain. They were delighted when the, uh, the JCPOA, which, uh, we, which is our shorthand for the nuclear deal, opened their economy in 2015 and European companies poured in with an initial $18 billion for joint ventures. And then they were devastated when in 2018, these companies went home and instead a raft of new sanctions struck their country. My second point is what's happening inside Iran at the moment, and it's really fascinating. There is a huge amount of public debate, headline reporting, and political party maneuvering taking place around this assassination and all the other elements that are part of this uh, re return to the JCPOA. Iran is frequently described as an authoritarian society with high levels of censorship and reprisal. And uh, in fact, it's in good company. Most of the countries in its region would fit that description. But the level of public disagreement and political debate and counter argument in Iran today over what to do or not to do and why could not possibly occur, I would argue, in any of its neighbors. It's just that much freer in these kind of areas. Despite the heavy handedness of the government, it has newspapers on different sides of the political divide and a form of party politics and everything at the moment is in high gear. New information on the nuclear scientist that has just been killed, for example, showing that he was a key player in the testing that made it possible to bring in the JCPOA back in 2015 has been all over the TV. But so has a counter story based on recent taped conversations that he was actually against rejoining the JCPOA. And this has triggered hours of television talk show debate with accusations and conspiracy theories bandied back and forth on all sides of the political spectrum. The third point I wanna make relates to this uh, case of the bill that has just been passed in parliament. It's been basically put forward by a conservative majority of young, inexperienced, and a very rambunctious group of junior representatives. And they are absolutely gleeful that their bill, which they're calling the strategic action to lifting of sanctions, and, and which was just passed yesterday, can possibly act as an answer to Trump's maximum pressure and actually help force the US to accept some of Iran's terms in returning to the JCPOA. And these include compens uh, compensation for the cost of the sanctions and some kind of guarantee that a Biden successor won't once again walk away from the deal. The president of Iran, Rouhani, and his moderate team have criticized the bill as not helpful at all. And it won't become law, in fact, until it is passed by a higher cover government committee. However, it clearly has served a useful purpose. It has operated as a political deflector for the public rage against the US and Israel, which as Barbara mentioned, is thought to have conducted this last uh, assassination. So in place of a military response, Iran has in fact adopted a political one, which by any measure is the more acceptable. And there's another twist. If Iran can hold out for the next several weeks and start negotiations with the Biden team in January, then the conservatives can now claim some of the credit if the sanctions are lifted. 
And since the presidential campaign is gearing up for election in June, we can see this was from their perspective, a very timely and savvy political move. Finally and fourthly, although the prize of lifted sanctions is significant, there are numbers of Iran's leaders and particularly the Supreme Leader and others in the population that feel very ambivalent about going back to the deal. As the country has battled surge after surge of the coronavirus, it has received little outside aid thanks to US sanctions. It's not been able to access its own foreign reserves to pay for needed imports, or even as a longtime member of the IMF, to collect on a line of credit from the IMF COVID relief program without an American go ahead. As a country with strong scientific and medical expertise and a broad well-funded health network, it has succeeded in keeping deaths lower than in many other states, including England. But it has done so largely because it produces its own PPE and medicines and the costs of isolation and a tanking economy have been high. The twin calamities of COVID and maximum pressure sanctions, not to mention all these attacks, have only underscored to many Iranians that they really don't need the West or the US, which they feel really have betrayed them and left this UN recognized deal with no real provocation or reason. They feel that they were possibly therefore really wrong to go into the JCPOA in the first place. If the nuclear deal is to be revived, the most important element will be to rebuild Iran's trust in America's word. As a set of first steps in establishing goodwill, President-elect Biden has promised to live the, lift the Muslim ban in the US give a green light to this IMF loan or line of credit so Iran's economy can stabilize and small businesses can be rescued. And uh, he's promised to release Iran's foreign reserves. Iran in turn has promised its renewed nuclear enrichment program, which literally went from zero to over 2000 kilos uh, since Trump walked away from the deal can easily be reversed and it will need to show that it can demobilize this program and let in international inspectors. But without first getting the JCPOA itself back on track and both sides to establishing committed trust in each other, no further negotiations will ever see the light of day. And even getting this first step signed and delivered is clearly not going to be easy. Thank you. Barbara, you're muted. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> You'd think I've done enough of these Zooms by now. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Roxanne. That was very helpful and, and also packed in a lot of information and we're going, to, we're going to return to a lot of these points. I want to turn to Paul. I want to ask you, Paul, about the, the regional uh, realignment. We have seen clearly uh, over the last couple of years that Arab countries that had been very reluctant to, uh, to be seen as close to Israel have dropped that reluctance. Uh, we have normalization agreements between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, between Bahrain and Israel, Sudan and Israel, um, obviously uh, motivated by concerns over Iran, at least to some extent. Uh, as we speak, uh, Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law, is in the region apparently trying to at least partially mend the rift between Qatar and Saudi Arabia, which has uh, uh, benefited Iran uh, because Qatar is using Iranian airspace for flights, things like that. But I also want to, if you don't mind, add on because we have our first question in the Q&A and it's a really good question. It's from Naila, uh, Naila Abu Hamad and she asks about Iran's uh, very strong relationship with Hezbollah, uh, with its activities in Syria, she, uh, she asks, um, um, let's see, she says, Lebanese people want an end to Hezbollah and an end to being hijacked by Iran. They're suffering and would like to see the problem of Israel, US, Iran, Syria completely done with and solved. How can Lebanon be free from Iran and when? 
Uh, and she, she further notes that Hezbollah has been passing money and aid to Syria, depriving the Lebanese people of what they need. And of course, as Roxanne knows, there's, there's a lot of complaints within Iran that Iranian resources, even under sanctions and COVID, have been uh, spent on propping up Hezbollah and uh, the Assad government in Syria, uh, militias in Iraq. So that's a huge introduction. Uh, to you to try to uh, unpack the regional context for uh, this situation. But I okay. know you can do it, Paul. Oh, sure. Well, th thanks, Barbara. And those are really excellent uh, summaries by you and Roxanne about the overall situation and the perspectives from inside uh, Iran. Uh, let, let me start with, as you noted, Barbara, that, quote, everybody, unquote, uh, assumes that Israel did the Fakhrizadeh uh, assassination. And I think that's um, an appropriate assumption because uh, the Netanyahu government in Israel has the record, it has the methods, it has the motives, uh, and I'm personally pretty confident that that's, that's where the responsibility lay. So I think the first question to address is, you know, what, what were the motivations on the Israeli side and how that fits into the overall strategy? Uh, it is not a matter uh, of setting back the nuclear program, partly for the reasons that have already been mentioned. Uh, the work on the weapons you know, ended you know, almost two decades ago. Um, taking out you know, one nuclear scientist does not appreciably put a dent into the Iranian nuclear program any more than the serial assassinations of other Iranian nuclear scientists back in 2011, 2012 did. Um, Rather, uh, and, and I might add as well, if it really were a matter simply of, of the nuclear weapons threat, then we would have had Israel supporting, not opposing the JCPOA, since as we've heard from uh, retired senior Israeli security officials at the time that the accord was signed, uh, they appropriately recognized that having strict limits on Iran's nuclear program and closing all possible paths to a bomb really is in Israel's interest. So what's the thinking of the Netanyahu government? Well, it is to try to keep uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran as isolated, as sanctioned, as weak, as loathed as it possibly can. And that's been you know, the constant refrain uh, from Mr. Netanyahu's government, both rhetorically and in terms of, of, of action. Uh, you know, the overall goals are to ensure that the United States uh, is firmly on the camp of the, the anti-Iranian side of the great Middle Eastern divide as the Trump administration has tried to define it and as the Netanyahu government has tried to define it. Uh, they don't wanna see any diplomacy or any business done with Tehran by the United States or anyone else that keeps a potential regional rival, namely Iran, weak. Uh, it ensures that Israel is always gonna be you know, the prime partner for the United States in the region. Uh, it keeps Iran as a kind of bete noir that uh, can be blamed for anything going wrong in the Middle East. And that serves as a wonderful distraction anytime subjects that the Netanyahu government itself does not want to have come up and discussed. Uh, the, the immediate response is, well, of course, Iran is, is the real problem in our region. So that's, that's the general set of objectives. The, the more specific matters with things like the Fakhrizadeh uh, assassination have to do with the impending end of the Trump administration and the fact that there will be a change of power here in Washington. Uh, it would have been too much of a coincidence in terms of timing to say that this just reflected when an operational opportunity came up. I, I very much doubt that. Uh, it, it is a matter of trying to screw up the diplomacy of the next US administration and to try to uh, you know, stoke the fire the confrontation as much as possible to make that diplomacy as hard as possible. More specifically, even though it is obviously beyond the uh, control of the Israeli government in terms of exactly how the Iranians respond, and Roxanne described the dilemma that the Iranian leadership faces, well, if on the one hand they do manage to hold off the, the desires for revenge and exercise restraint, uh, out of their own interest in not screwing up diplomacy with the US, US administration. Well, at the very least, uh, the Israeli government has uh, shown Iran to be weak um, and um, you know, puts them down a couple of notches. But I think what would be even the, the, the more preferred scenario from the Netanyahu government's point of view is for the Iranians to do something 
in retaliation that would in turn be an, a rationale for Israel or preferably the United States while the Trump administration is still in control, striking back with some kind of military attack. That would be, do an even better job of messing up diplomacy you know, for weeks and months to come, even after January 20th. Um, so that, that I think is the, um, the specific reasoning that, that, that underlie you know, this most recent assassination. And it's, it comes on the heels of a lot of other provocation. Uh, you mentioned, I think Barbara, you mentioned the, the explosions earlier this year. They were concentrated in June and July and they were focused not, not only on military related and nuclear targets, but things like petrochemical plants and power plants and oil pipelines were being hit too. Um, it just anything could be a provocation. So far, the, the Iranians have managed to restrain themselves pretty well. Now, let me turn to the, to the Gulf countries. Uh, and with regard to the, the, you know, the upgrading of the relations between the UAE and Saudi Arabia and, and, and Israel, it really is mostly about Iran, uh, seeing the Iranians as a, as a, as a common enemy or, or rival. Uh, that has been the principal motivator. Um, and focusing on Saudi Arabia, uh, the regime there now you know, led in effect by the young crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, has some of the same uh, objectives as the Netanyahu government in terms of keeping Iran isolated and punished, ensuring that they have the support of Washington in a way that Washington will never uh, uh, come close to having with, with, with Iran. Um, and indeed, uh, Mohammed bin Salman probably has at least as much, uh, uh, shall we say, things to distract attention from as Mr. Netanyahu does with regard to his drive for personal power, human rights violations in Saudi Arabia, and of course, a very sore spot for us back here in the United States, the assassination of uh, Jamal Khashoggi uh, in, in a consulate in, in, in Turkey. I think the one respect in which the Saudi motivations do differ from those of the Netanyahu government is the Saudis do not want an all out war. Uh, they would like to see the confrontation stop short of uh, bombs and missiles flying in the Persian Gulf. They got a reminder of how that could hurt their own interests uh, in the attack on the Saudi oil facilities back in September of last year. Now, this was on the, the critical processing point at Abqaiq as well as the Quraysh uh, oil field. And this was a, 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 an impressive demonstration of ability on the part of the Iranians uh, you know, using uh, cruise missiles and drones to do pinpoint attacks on, on a key uh, piece of oil infrastructure. So I think that the general reaction in the Saudi regime was, whoa, we don't want to take the chance that that happened again. So, so there's, not, there's not a tendency to press things quite to the, to the as far as, as I think the Israeli government is pressing things as far as uh, you know, a possible war is concerned. Um, I think, and I would indirectly bring in the question about, you know, how do we deal with what's going on in Syria and how it affects in a tragic way the Lebanese, because I think they're all part of one pot and until and unless, you know, the Iranians and their neighbors on the other side of the Gulf, uh, you know, learn to uh, accept the proposition that they're all part of the same neighborhood and none of them are going to go away. Um, that the kinds of, of interests that drive what the Iranians are doing in support of the Assad regime and the Iranian relationship with Hezbollah and so on, none of that's gonna go away. Um, I, I think there is, although I've described the motivations of the Saudis, uh, you know, some hope when you look at uh, the rest of the Gulf Arab uh, side of things. Now, the Bahrainis, they're kind of little brothers of the Saudis, a very vulnerable regime. Uh, run by Sunnis facing a discontented uh, Shia majority. So they're going to be pretty much uh, following the lead of Riyadh. Um, the UAE, well, you know, they've shown some, some flexibility more recently, especially in beginning their pullout from the, the Yemeni war. Uh, and you have even within the Emirates, especially in Dubai, uh, the one Emirate that's, that has had, you know, a lot of cross uh, Gulf trade with the Iranians. Um, and then when you move beyond those three and you look at the rest of the, the Gulf Arab countries, I think there's a lot of uh, not just willingness, but attempts to try to reach uh, cross Gulf detente 
uh, the Omanis uh, have been, uh, you know, very critical players in some of the uh, quiet mediation that's taken place in the past that's involved the U.S. government and the Iranians leading up to the, the negotiations that produced the JCPOA. The Kuwaitis have also uh, tried to act as mediators between their Gulf Arab brethren and Tehran. And as for the Gutteries, and you mentioned, uh, you know, the, this, this most recent effort to heal the breach with the Saudis, uh, and here we have to, you know, disentangle the motivations. I think what, you know, Mr. Kushner is main, mainly interested in is taking away those, uh, those fees paid to the Iranians for the overflight rights. Yeah. <laughs> so they'd like to see Qatar Airways fly over Saudi Arabia again. Uh, I, I think uh, more of the interest of the Gutteries is to see the whole temperature of the confrontation between Persians and Arabs reduced. Uh, the Gutteries uh, uh, have had their own more substantial relationship with Iran. They share possession with the Iranians of the world's largest gas field in the Gulf. And just for practical reasons, um, uh, they, they have to keep that relationship on an even keel. So uh, a mixture of motivations here, uh, some not very encouraging motivations that explain things like this recent assassination, but I think more continuing interests of a more positive sort that can be built on and that I hope the new US administration will build on. Yeah, indeed. I think there's a hope for, for a return to diplomacy uh, writ large after, after all of these uh, assassinations and, and sabotage and so on. Um, I have a question, but uh, not a full question. So let me invite Ali al Hafaji to uh, perhaps write the full question that you have. He's, he says that he has a question about um, the involvement of Iran and in Iraq. And of course, as we know, uh, the US decision to invade Iraq in 2003 uh, and overthrow Saddam Hussein uh, it was supposed to create an Iraqi uh, democracy and instead it opened the door wide uh, to uh, Iranian, more Iranian influence and a return of uh, Iraqis, many of whom had uh, been harbored by Iran uh, under the Saddam uh, regime. Um, so uh, Ali, if you want to uh, ask a specific question or do you just want a general discussion about uh, Iranian involvement in Iraq? I do not see anything, here we go. Iran-backed groups in Iraq are a source of instability. Yes, that is true. Uh, and would you just like a comment on that and, and what the prospects are? Okay, let me, let, me, uh, let me pose that, but let me also ask uh, Roxanne first to, um, to give us a sense of how do Iranians view their government's uh, involvement in all of these Arab conflicts as, as Iranians would put? And I should, preface this by saying that in my own trips to Iran, and I've, I've been lucky enough to go there nine times, um, you, know, you always hear Iranians are anti-Semitic. And I discovered, yes, Iranians are anti-Semitic. They don't like Arabs very much. <laughs> uh, I have to say that uh, I never discerned a particular discrimination against Jews. There was a dislike perhaps for some of Israel's policies, but there was a distinct uh, dislike for Arabs and a sense that Iran was kind of wasting its time propping up the Palestinians and that sort of thing. So how do Iranians feel about this, this huge regional footprint that their country has now? Well, I think a great deal of it has to do with geopolitical drivers rather than ideological or let's say sectarian uh, religious drivers. And I think that's the first thing that very often gets lost in this mix is that people think it's only to support Shia. It's what we've often been told is the Shia crescent. And indeed it does look very much like that on the map, except when one does throw in uh, groups such as Hamas or uh, there are other groups that it supports um, that aren't, then then it becomes clearly more driven by a, a broader uh, uh, construct. But I think the, the real issue is that Iran has been extremely isolated since it became involved in this four decade long um, standoff with the US, which itself has translated over those decades into more and more um, conflict between Israel and, and um, Iran, which we've talked about now uh, at some length, and also a, a colder and colder relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia. And although very often this um, 
this, these relationships are translated in religious terms because they work really well as political propaganda. In fact, it's very much a, a geopolitical or geostrategic situation. So its support of Syria, for example, stems way back at the time of the first uh, uh, Gulf War, where in many ways, uh, Syria or the Iran-Iraq War, I should say, where Syria was the only Arab country to actually support it. Now, in a typical fashion uh, that, that marks so much of the uh, relationships in the Middle East, it didn't necessarily support Iran because it thought Iran was great, but it was really supporting it because it didn't like Iraq. So, but nonetheless, it ha th that has been a solid support structure. The two of them have ideologically been very anti-American and uh, very anti-Israel. And so they have found common ground. So when uh, the uh, Syrians finally the government there needed help, it was a natural opportunity for Iran to return the favor. And in some ways, that is very much what, what this all began as. It certainly has turned into an opportunity for Iran to uh, gain a great deal of on the ground uh, military experience uh, by sending its militias out into a wider net. It certainly connects now with this uh, Shia crescent over to Hezbollah, so we can see that it's useful from a land bridge type of perspective. And it certainly has helped it develop a very important role as a partner with Russia, which also has come into Syria. So that's the larger picture from an Iranian perspective in terms of the people on the street, it's mixed as so often everything is. Now there's no two, two Iranians that have the same view about anything. And I think that part of that is based on the fact that sanctions has really affected that economy. So there's always the sense that anything spent uh, on something else is to be considered carefully and there's got to be a very good justification for it. And I think there's a large number of people that do not think that the Syria or even Hezbollah ventures really warrant that kind of expenditure. On the other hand, there is a wealth, uh, solid feeling that Iran can't be absolutely isolated and on its own. It's got to develop friends and it's got to develop a, what we often call an asymmetric capacity, which if the huge military capacity that the United States has and which it's sold off in many ways to both the Israeli and the Saudi um, military complexes, if it's going to balance that at all, it's got to do it on the on the on the ground on very to be quick of fleet of foot and that's what these militias are and um and it has certainly succeeded in uh concerning a great number of americans and others in terms of its 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 approach and i think there's a certain amount of pride on the part of iranians that at least it's holding up its head and that it has a, a regional role which it's had to fight tooth and nail for yeah, Paul. Let me ask you specifically about Iraq. Uh, you know, clearly, uh, the Iraqi state is not in control of it of these forces. It has no monopoly over the use of force. There are dozens of militias uh, that uh, some of them that date back to the Iran Iraq War. Uh, groups like the Badr Brigades, then newer groups that were created after the U.S. invasion and still other groups that were created after ISIS uh, uh, stormed into Iraq and, and uh, took over Mosul uh, back in 2014. Is there any hope that these groups can eventually be incorporated in the Iraqi military, that Iranian influence can be reduced? Or are we facing a situation like, like the one in Lebanon as mentioned by the questioner where Hezbollah has become more powerful than any other force in Lebanon. Uh, clearly it has the military power, has economic power, and um, it's impossible to really think of creating a government that isn't somehow uh, beholden to Hezbollah. Well, I think the short answer to your question, Barbara, is yes, it, there is hope. And I, I would not um, uh, depict any of the Iraqi militias as comparable to a Hezbollah in Lebanon. I mean. The, Lebanese Hezbollah is really in a class by itself in terms of non-group important allies of, of Iran. Uh, with regard to Iraq itself, you know, in, uh, Roxanne just touched on this, the, the most important thing to remember about the Iranian, and I would argue the Iraqi as well, perspectives is, is the history of the Iran-Iraq war, an extremely costly conflict in the 1980s that went on for 
eight years. You know, the casualty figures are somewhat in doubt, but by most estimates, the Iranians suffered casualties in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, the Iraqi losses were also very high. So it is a, a prime objective of Iranian strategic thinking and policy to never ever let anything like that happen again. <laughs> they share a 900 mile border with Iraq. And so it is very strongly in the interests of Iran and they were always, Tehran will always put high priority on this to have a relationship with whoever is in power in Baghdad that is at least cordial. Uh, not, it doesn't have to be a proxy relationship, uh, but it has to be one where nothing like what happened in the 1980s will ever happen again. So that, that's, that's a very big part of the background, I think, on the thinking on both sides of that border. And then more recently, there was the whole ISIS experience and its uh, uh, sudden surge taking over, you know, about a third of Iraq uh, as of 2014. And, you know, the Iranian help and the Iranian supported militias were absolutely critical to uh, uh, taming that beast and defeating ISIS. Um, if you look at the initial performance during that period of what passed for the Iraqi regular army, it was embarrassing. Uh, they basically cut and ran. And if it weren't for the militias, uh, it would have been an even worse situation uh, with regard to ISIS. And then in what followed, we had one of the um, you know, rare, what amounted to de facto cooperation between the United States and Iran, you know, somewhat uh, echoing what happened back in Afghanistan some years earlier, in which you know, U.S. provided the air power and mm -hmm. Iranian support on the ground to some of these militias acting together um, uh, helped, uh, you know, defeat the, the so-called caliphate of, mm -hmm. of ISIS. Um, so it, it it, 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 we're, we're still a long ways away from anything like uh, total incorporation of the, uh, of the militias into a, a strictly regular force. But you can see the reasons uh, from not just Iran's point of view, but from the point of view of the leadership in Baghdad, why uh, they, they really cannot um, move in the direction of, well, let's do away with the militias or let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's change the situation drastically. It's not going to happen soon, but it's not going to be a Lebanese Hezbollah type situation where you have basically yeah. a state within a state. Let me let me follow on that because Noela uh, Abu Hamad uh, uh, says that her, her question was not answered. Any idea how we can get rid of the influence of Iran in Lebanon without a war? It's not an easy answer, and I think um, the, the difficulty here is that it presumes, and I, I'm sure the question is coming from a great deal of knowledge of what's on the ground there, but it does presume that the people of all the people of Lebanon don't want Hezbollah there, and that is simply not the case. If there was, uh, if there was not support in Lebanon among the Shia, among the southern uh, Lebanese for the role that, that Hezbollah plays, I think it would have much less uh, traction there, but they do feel as though they're between, they're in a very difficult uh, territorial spot. They're between, uh, you know, very close up to Israel. They were, it was a region of, of, of several wars. And, um, and so I think there is a sense that this is not something that can easily be released until there is at least a better government in Lebanon. There is some kind of economic uh, coherency in that state. And instead, we're seeing that Lebanon as a central government and state uh, is losing control and has actually moved in a very negative way. So until Lebanon itself can establish itself on solid footing, there's no chance, I think, in my view, that any kind of understanding and reduction in Hezbollah would take shape. If I can just interject, I mean, I'm by no means an expert on, on Lebanon, but the degree of corruption that appears to uh, that appears to involve all the various uh, factions, the nature of the system whereby you have uh, a Christian Maronite president, a Sunni prime minister, a Shia speaker, uh, you know, and, and unfortunately we replicated, the United States replicated that system to some extent in, in, in Iraq. It just invites uh, patronage and corruption where each group gets its slice of the pie, doesn't want to give it up and uh, does not think about the interests of the country writ large.
but only of its own particular uh, faction. And you know how Lebanon can change that system after all these years uh, is is a real question. I would I would uh, put back to to the questioner. Um, let me ask this one. This comes from James Kelly. Will we see a policy of constructive engagement with Iran in the not too distant future, perhaps driven by business interests? Um, now, certainly after the JCPOA was signed, as Roxanne pointed out, we saw a lot of Europeans uh, going to Iran. Uh, under the deal, Boeing was supposed to sell $18 billion worth of planes uh, to Iran to refurbish its civilian uh, airline. I don't know, maybe Iran lucked out that it didn't buy any of the, 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 de the defective Boeings uh, that apparently have now been revamped. But uh, definitely there was hope for um, that Iran would, that economic isolation would be, uh, would be relieved and that it, this would somehow encourage Iran perhaps to behave differently in the region. I don't know, Paul or, or Roxanne, if you have any thoughts on this idea, can we, can we hope for constructive engagement well, uh, if the US goes back to the JCPOA? Yes, and, and there's certainly, even just looking at it from a very selfish US American economic point of view, uh, yeah, there is a motivation there. You mentioned the Boeing deal that, uh, that came a cropper. Um, it, this is one of the you know, great you know, untold facts about the JCPOA and, and the reneging on it by the subsequent administration. Uh, you know, far from the JCPOA entailing the United States, you know, paying things. We heard all these stories about the, you know, the pallets of cash, which was actually just making good on a deal that would to sell airplanes to the Shah many years ago, with airplanes we never delivered. Um, and, and the US never didn't, didn't pay a penny to the Iranian regime. It was the rest was a matter of unfreezing assets that already blame, blame, uh, already belonged to the Iranians. Uh, you know, far from, from giving up things what, that uh, cost us something, we gave up business opportunities and, and certainly aerospace. And you look back at uh, the kinds of uh, business deals that were done and defense related things um, uh, in the time of the Shah. Now, I'm not saying, you know, the US defense industry is going to start selling arms to the Iranians, uh, but, but this is a large economy with uh, over 80 million people. And uh, there are an awful lot of, you know, peaceful civilian goods uh, where the United States uh, business could get a piece of the action, but it's not getting any at all since we've uh, uh, decided to sanction them. Yeah. If, if I can maybe uh, continue and I'll have Roxanne uh, 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 answer this. Uh, this is from Simin Curtis. Hi, Simin. Um, realistically, what are the most optimis optimistic developments we could hope for with Iran in the Biden administration? Uh, and she also mentions that there are so many Iranian students in the US who've been unable to see their families because of Trump's uh, Muslim ban. Um, and uh, so, I mean, we know that, that, that Biden has promised on day one to lift those restrictions. And so hopefully we'll see uh, more students coming, more Iranians in general coming to the United States to see their families and so on. But realistically, what do you think? Uh, I mean, Roxanne, you mentioned that there's, you know, whatever trust there was seems to be drastically reduced because of the way the Trump administration pulled out of the, the deal and, and reimposed sanctions. Are Iranians really hoping for much from Biden or are they pretty cynical by now? Well, the point that um, I think, first of all, there's several very specific and, and they're not smaller, but they're more contained issues that really could be addressed. And one of them is prisoner swaps. And we just have seen this and the foreign minister today in Iran mentioned that he too thought it was really important that this continue. And so I think that saves lives. And I think that's really important to both countries. And it also helps on the humanitarian side uh, to, to smooth feathers. So I think we could definitely see that. Um, and I do think that there should probably over some, if, if we're able to lift sanctions and if actually funds are, are unfrozen and some level of uh, exchange can start taking place. And I completely agree with Paul. I think that there is a great deal of business opportunity. However, even when this was first signed by the Obama administration, Iran felt uh, very much that it had ratcheted back its, its, its nuclear 
uh, enrichment and that its understanding of the deal was that all sanctions would be lifted. And in fact, it turned out that a, a lot of American sanctions were not lifted. UN and EU ones were, but a number of American ones were not. And further, there was no real go ahead given by the American government to banks across the world to uh, not feel that they were taking a risk in doing business with Iran. So yeah, I'm going to differ with you a little bit on that, because actually, I, I even know some of the American diplomats who were sent around the world to give pep talks to banks, but the banks would not engage with Iran. And let's face it, uh, Iran's financial sector is rather murky. And uh, there is the influence of groups like the Is uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, not just in banks, but also in a lot of uh, Iranian industries, uh, not always clear uh, who owns what. Uh, and there was a process, I mean, and this, this is also, I think, a important to point out, there was a process whereby Iran was going to try to uh, adhere to international standards set by the Financial Action Task Force, so-called FATF rules of the road. And that was interrupted by the fact that Trump quit the, 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 uh, the Iran nuclear deal. So I guess the question is whether, you know, sanctions encourage more corruption, more smuggling. Is it too late to kind of turn this around and and, and not only lift the sanctions, but, but you know, have Iran make the kinds of reforms that would be necessary to really uh, earn the trust of, of international business. Well, you're perfectly right that one of the, the real attacks against Iran is that a lot of the incoming funds or that the funds it uses in business gets uh, siphoned off to the to the inter to the Islamic uh, Revolutionary Guard, and indeed, it's a it's a difficult problem because they are very involved in the in the economy. On the other hand, I think that there are several different uh, elements at play, and you were absolutely right. There were diplomats that went all over the place at the time and assured banks, but what the what the Iranians are asking for today is a. Uh, a, a form of, of um, documentation that actually ensures that the bank will be protected from American sanctions. And they never received that the first time around. And because there's been so much lack of trust and so much sense that these could change on a dime, which in fact, uh, Trump's walking out of the deal showed, uh, the banks are hesitant and they need to have some kind of confirmation from the American banking se sector that this, uh, that at least a certain range of their support won't be uh, undercut. And another really in interesting thing is you're absolutely right. The Iranians uh, didn't fulfill the uh, international banking FATF uh, requirements, which have to do with laundering and all sorts of other things, according to the uh, requirements of the institution that is actually uh, based in France. But what is very interesting, and I've been talking to uh, people that have uh, that are investors there, the, the stock market, which may surprise many of you, has been very, very um, active over this last year and done very well. And so there, these are people that actually are used to bringing funds back and forth. And what's interesting is that the anti-laundering, anti-terrorism um, mechanisms on Iranian financial instruments are stronger, in, in fact, than the FATF ones, but they are not uh, going to agree to be constrained by a Western uh, set of, of demands and rules. And this is one of the areas I think that we run into when any of us are trying to analyze the situation in Iran and the US and what the future of sanctions are, or the lifting of, of business deals are going to be because the, the, the approach of, an, of a separate country in doing, or it's a country such as, as Iran that is outside of the international system doesn't necessarily mean it's doing it less strongly, but it does mean it's not doing it according to the same kinds of rules. And so there's often a sense that they can't find common ground. And I think what we're really all hoping for is that we try to find some common ground because there's a great deal of business to be doing. And meanwhile, the Chinese are moving in there. So yeah, I think yeah. we all want to see American business beginning to pick up in Iran. Yeah, um, we're, we're uh, unbelievably a whole hour has passed. Ah, here we have uh, a new question. 
I have another one myself, but let me let me ask from the audience. This comes from uh, Peter uh, Grewar. Um, apart from the obvious, i.e. easing sanctions, what would be the motivation of Iranians to re-enter negotiations, to re-enter the JCPOA, um, given that it's entirely possible and likely that Trump will run for president again? in 2024 uh, and has, a, has a, a chance of regaining uh, the White House. I, I'm not sure I agree with you, Peter. I think that, that Trump has had his one and done, uh, but that he sees running for president as a great way to continue to get publicity and to, and to raise, it seems, unlimited funds from his uh, supporters uh, to put into his own pocket. Um, but yeah, what uh, I, I guess this is really for you also, Roxanne. Is there you know, what would be the motivation to re-enter? And, and let me ask both of you, if I may, what are the chances for a bigger bargain? What are the chances for normalization between the United States and Iran that would lift the primary sanctions, not just the sanctions that we inflict on others? Is it going to take uh, some sort of uh, detente between Israel uh, and Iran, given the hold that Israel uh, continues to have uh, on U.S. politics, it may be somewhat diminished from what it was uh, some years ago, but uh, still there is seems to be a general commitment to uh, Israel's se security. What will it take? Um, is Iran at all interested in it, or is it happy to simply turn toward Russia and China uh, and, uh, and, and really say, well, we don't need the United States, we don't need the West? So whoever wants to go first. Well, let me, I'd like to hark partly back to the previous question, Barbara, and, and because I'm afraid we might be getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. You know, the earlier question was, uh, you know, what, what would be the optimistic thing to happen, you know, after January 20th? Um, well, basically it would be, in my view, uh, reinstituting total compliance with the JCPOA. And uh, Biden wants that and the Iranians want that, but we shouldn't leave the impression that it's gonna be all that simple. There is gonna be a delicate issue of sequencing here. Uh, you know, the Iranians who are the ones who got hit with all this economic warfare, even though they were complying with the agreement are gonna to wanna to see some first moves from the United States, uh, which might not be politically very easy for the Biden administration to do. Uh, I, I think this dance can be choreographed um, but it's not going to be a matter of the United States sitting back and saying, Iran, you got to come back in compliance with the, with the nuclear restrictions and then we'll lift sanctions. No, that, that, that's a non-starter. So, so that, that dance has to be choreographed first. Then once you get past that, then we get in some of these issues that we were just discussing a moment ago, um, uh, such as the, Barbara, what you correctly described as the uh, reluctance of the private sector among you know, European banks and businesses to do business because they're, they're afraid of what's, what the US Treasury is going to do, not just next month, but next year. Uh, I see that as part of some follow-on negotiations after the JCPOA is brought fully into effect. Um, we have a lot of people on the US side talking about, well, we've got to do something about those sunset clauses. These are the uh, certain restrictions on the Iranian nuclear uh, program that under the JCPOA expire after a period of years and they get freer to you know, enrich more uranium and so on. Well, I see possible deals made up the, uh, up the road in which um, some of those limitations get extended in return for somehow the Iranians getting greater assurance that they're gonna get more business uh, from the private sector you know, that, that the US administration realizes that even what the Obama administration did in the past in terms of the efforts to comfort banks and so on just wasn't enough and something more is gonna to have to be done. And then with regard to the, the second question, uh, the, the specter of a, you know, a, a Donald Trump uh, returning you know, in 2024, I have no doubt and Roxanne, I, I, I assume you would agree that, that the Iranians are thinking some of the same sorts of thoughts and, and, and <laughs> would like to see greater assurance uh, <clears throat> that, 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 that can, what happened in 2018 in Washington in terms of the US reneging can't happen again. Now, whether that means moving to a formal treaty or something else, I'm not sure, but somehow um, uh, the Iranians are gonna look for greater assurances of, of not having a repeat of that experience. And, and what about the Israel question, Paul? I mean, 
you know, as you pointed out, Bibi Netanyahu benefits from having Iran as a, as a, yeah. a scapegoat. But on the other hand, uh, you know, Israel does face concerns and threats. Hezbollah has 100,000 rockets that it could rain down on, on uh, Israel, Israeli towns and cities. Uh, Iran is entrenched in Syria, and there have been Iranians wandering around close to the border with uh, the Golan Heights. Um, I mean, these are legitimate concerns, and there is still a relationship, I don't know how strong it is anymore, between Iran and Hamas and Iran and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Well, uh, two overall observations, Barbara. One, uh, with regard to things like, you know, the rocket stockpile of Hezbollah, this, as I intimated uh, earlier in my remarks, can't be separated from these larger competitions and confrontations. From Iran's point of view, uh, Hezbollah's rockets are part of Iran's deterrence right. against uh, nasty and very destructive things Israel could do, uh, a nuclear armed Israel could do to uh, Iran. And so I don't think, uh, and getting back to the, that other question about are, how we, are we gonna see peace breaking out in Lebanon and you know, get rid of Iranian influence, that becomes a possibility, not only after some of those uh, internal problems in Lebanon get better addressed, but only when the Iranians see they don't need to rely so heavily on a deterrent like you know, 10,000 Hezbollah rockets uh, on, the, on the other side of the northern uh, Israeli border. My other observation is uh, in terms of the larger Israel side of this whole equation, I mean, this gets into broader US political stories that will continue to evolve. I think if there's hope there, it is in looking at things like, um, I'll get very specific in terms of domestic politics and demographics, you know, the American Jewish community um, progressively seeing themselves as not having the same sort of interests uh, as, as Israel or, or, or the Israeli Jewish community does. And this comes up more and more in polls. I mean, there's been a, a bifurcation there and, and I, I think this is part of uh, perhaps some hopeful political trends in the United States that might give us at least a glimmer of hope that uh, this big impediment to um, uh, de-escalating the confrontation in Iran uh, could, could be less, you know, five years from now or 10 years from now. But there are still plenty of other things. Uh, you know, I mentioned the U.S. Jewish community. Uh, you know, the, the Christian evangelicals have in fact been the larger political force for um, you know, having, taking a very hard line against Iran. And, you know, I don't see that going uh, away as a major political factor in, in U.S. politics anytime soon. Roxanne, let me, let me pose it to you. I mean, as I mentioned, I've never experienced uh, anti-Jewish feeling in in Iran, but the rhetoric the government uses, apart from its support for groups like Hezbollah and Hamas and so on, the Israel will be wiped from the pages of history, which is sometimes mistranslated into Iran will destroy Israel. Uh, but the rhetoric is harsh. We've had Holocaust denial and minimization under the Ahmadinejad presidency. The supreme leader uh, of the country, Hamenei himself, has poo-pooed the, the Holocaust. Um, what will it take? And, and, you know, here we have a situation where Israel has been knocking off Iranian scientists, which is not exactly conducive to, uh, to a relaxation of tensions there. But is there, is there something that on the Iranian side that might shift this, this uh, antagonism between two countries that had been quite friendly uh, before the revolution? Uh, well, I think we should look at this back in the in the, po the political and economic situation that Iran is finding itself in right now. And in, in many ways, if we look at what has been uh, on the in terms of establishing a new deal, a, a maximum pressure that has failed, it did not succeed in. In fact, if anything, we're more at risk because nuclear, even though it's very low, nuclear production has started again in Iran and no deal, new deal has come up. But the other side of that that we often don't talk about is how much it has raised tensions and fears of a war in the Gulf itself. And there, the last several years have seen 
quite a bit of uh, activity in terms of tankers that have had uh, explosions on both sides, and there have been tankers seized on both sides. And so there's been, and, and what Paul reflect, uh, referred to as, you know, there have been attacks on, on Saudi's oil fields. And there's, of course, the war in Yemen, which is the other side of this we haven't really mentioned, but which is also a proxy war of some kind uh, between Iran and the Saudis. So we see that that has really ratcheted up. And my feeling is that we're seeing two different strains here. One is that it, this, this uh, accord, the set of accords that the Gulf states have signed with, with Israel are a reaction to that. It's a way to try to find common uh, allies in a situation that was simply getting beyond tension. And once that tension might reduce, if Iran and the US can find much more common ground, can reduce the rhetoric, can lessen the concern about what might happen in the export of oil and the Hormuz Strait, that the desire on the part of the Gulf states to look as much towards Israel uh, may also somewhat lessen. Yeah. And I think the whole thing will become a more manageable and diplomatic exchange. But I think the other thing that we should not under, um, undercut is that the American administration has been extremely successful in bringing deals of um, relationships to the Middle East, to the Gulf that have not existed before. And although it may be very one-sided at the moment, Israel with the Gulf, there should be no real reason why similar motivations, capacities, and diplomatic uh, grace might be able to thereby make other deals possible. So over time, once relationships have settled and there have been perhaps more um, uh, a period of trust and less assassinations and less uh, explosions, that perhaps some kind of warmer relationship, perhaps even with the intercession of some of the Gulf states, between the players in that region that might include Iran and, and, Iran, and, and the Israelis being slightly less antagonistic might be something we can anticipate, perhaps in the longer future, but it's yeah. nice to look forward. You know, back should... several years uh, when Ahmadinejad was president, I had an opportunity to ask him one question. And uh, my question was, why do you keep saying such awful things about Israel? Don't, don't you understand that this just plays to Iran's disadvantage in terms of how it's seen uh, across the world, and I got kind of a non-committal. Well, I see your point, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. A, a, a couple of things. You know, I, I think I think you know the rhetoric, you know, does reflect some you know genuine anger. You know, when you do things like kill scientists and sabotage infrastructure, that does arouse emotions. But the Iranian regime is also playing, I think, to the Arab street uh, as it relates to the Palestinian issue and the unsolved Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, they are, you know, posing themselves as, especially now in the wake of these uh, upgrading of relations with some of the Gulf Arabs, as a better friend of oppressed Palestinian Arabs than other Arabs are. Um, well, they, you know, one of the implications of that is if you ever had a real resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, then that, you know, rhetorical point sort of goes by the boards and you wouldn't have the same incentive in Tehran to exploit the issue. Yeah, I think it's a very much, I totally agree with you. And I think it's been playing somewhat of a spoiler in, in, in this role, which I'm not so sure that it, it really feels that strongly about on the one hand. And, and I also would say that, you know, the, the relationship that it would like to have is definitely closer to the Gulf states. It's, it's across the Gulf with them. I think it's maintained that relationship with Qatar. And I think that it feels consistently, I mean, this is where the trust comes back. And the rhetoric, of course, has something to do with this, but the rhetoric is coming from all sides. Uh, I'm not saying Iran isn't fully part of that as a great rhetorical player, but I think it feels that, for example, one of the areas that we have talked perhaps less about is that one of the areas that a follow-on uh, deal that many are talking about in the United States would include missiles. And I think Iran, again, feels that it is, there's a double, um, uh, a double game that's going on on this because Israel has, has missiles that can go 5,000 uh, kilometers or miles, I'm very bad at that, kilometers and carry warheads, nuclear warheads, of which it has several. 
And the Saudis have a 5,000 uh, kilometer uh, war uh, missile as well. And the, there, we don't know what exactly they might be able to carry. And the Iranians have one that goes 2,000. And we know so far they don't have a bomb. And yet the concern is we've got to reduce Iran's missiles. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad idea, but I am saying they constantly feel as though there's a double standard that goes on. And I think that is what really needs to be worked on here is to, in order to get a group, a regional discussion, which is something that very often is now coming up as yeah. a possible alternative. Absolutely. Yeah, doing, doing anything about missiles, it's imperative to approach it on a regional basis. basis. And the one thing that right. I would add to, to what you mentioned, Roxanne, is in addition to all the missile capabilities that the neighbors and foes have, there's air, manned air forces are ones where uh, the neighbors like the UAE have a marked superiority over the Iranians whose own air force belongs mostly in a museum. <laughs> yeah. It does, indeed. Let me, let me do a little publicity for uh, some recommendations we put out at the Atlantic Council. We had a, a paper called Renewing Transatlantic Strategy on Iran and uh, it was full of suggestions for the way Europeans could help bridge the gap between now and when the Biden administration comes in and also talks about a, a bigger European uh, role in terms of uh, jumpstarting regional uh, diplomacy. Um, Roxanne, let me ask you, I mean, I, I, you know, the assassination of Fakhrizadeh, the, the EU put out a strong statement condemning it. I have not seen Britain, France and Germany, the, the vaunted E3, say uh, say boo about this assassination. Um, what's going on? Are they just waiting for Biden or uh, why aren't they uh, why aren't they stepping in? And what are your expectations for what the Europeans uh, can do uh, on their own or in conjunction with Biden? Well, you held a fantastic uh, uh, panel along with Federica Mogherini, Mogherini. Not long ago. And I thought that that really laid out a a very constructive EU role, which was to work behind, there, there were several levels, work behind the scenes to really encourage American diplomats to uh, imagine a step-by-step -step plan so that there would be what I think is often being called compliance for compliance so that both sides would comply. And second of all, that there be a constant European public encouragement for the Americans to uh, step up and to take this forward. I think from the Iranian point of view, if I could go back to that, the issue for them is that actually the Europeans too have uh, not been in compliance. That although they've never stepped back from the uh, the deal, and they f they have shown they feel it really strongly that it stay alive until the point where American uh, officials can start perhaps resuscitating uh, their part of the role, the Iranians feel very much as though the the Europeans didn't ensure that they could keep trading with uh, Iran, and so in many ways, although it was very much because of European dependence on American financial clout, the, the fact of the matter was that in many ways, they too enabled further sanctions on Iran because no further trade took place during that period. And the Iranians really hold it against the Europeans. They feel as though they were the ones that understood the importance of this. They had been part of it right from the beginning. In fact, uh, you mentioned Oman earlier on, Paul, but it was actually the EU that were the initial ones to try to get over a nuclear uh, plan. And in fact, Rouhani, who is currently the president of Iran, was the initial Iranian negotiator at that time. So it's all got a long history. And I think they have felt very betrayed by the, the Europeans. I don't think the Europeans could have done much about it, but I do think that there is that sense of, of betrayal. So I think it, it, it shows that um, two things. I think the Europeans, I was just in a, a discussion today with the Germans, and it seems that they have, are definitely waiting on an American um, lead. They will support the Europeans as a an EU statement, but unfortunately they're not so far uh, going out uh, in advance, and it undercuts their constant um, complaint ab against uh, Iran for abrogating human rights, because this is a pretty st straightforward human right that you shouldn't have members of your 
community and your population assassinated by foreign powers. And that should be something that they should have stood up for. So it's complex across the board. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're coming to the end. I'm going to give Paul a, a chance for last words. Uh, I'll just point out that on December the 16th, the uh, Joint Commission, which um, is supposed to monitor implementation of the JCPOA, is going to, to meet. And this will include uh, uh, representatives from China and uh, Russia and Britain, France, Germany, um, uh, with Iran, and uh, as well as the EU, which chairs this. Uh, so that may be an opportunity to begin the sort of discussion about sequencing of a return to full compliance on the part of the, all the parties to, to the JCPOA. Uh, the Biden administration, you know, it can't really engage. All it can do is, is kind of message uh, at this point in public statements before it, it takes over, it's not gonna do a, a Michael Flynn and have private conversations with people uh, before it's in office, uh, which, which is not supposed to be done. Um, but you know, uh, Joe Biden did give an interview to the New York Times, I believe it was yesterday, in which he once again reiterated that the United States wants to go back into the JCPOA as step one and then build on it. And I think that's an important signal to send. So, um, Paul, any any last uh, last thoughts you would like to to impart? And actually, I have one for Roxanne too uh, on on who she thinks will be the next president of Iran, and maybe that'll be the end. Anything else you wanna you wanna say before we we close this out? Well, just uh, I leave with these two thoughts. One is you know the current U.S. policy of maximum pressure has had plenty of time to show any chance of success, and it's been a complete failure on every ground. You know the nuclear ground the ground of Iranian behavior in the region and its effect on Iranian politics and, and strengthening the hardliners. So uh, I don't think there, any argument can be made uh, that, that has plausibility that, well, we just need to stick this out a little bit longer and something good will happen. The other parting thought is, uh, you know, we have a tendency in talking about Iran in this country to lapse into a, a kind of shorthand, you know, malign behavior, support for terrorism, yeah, or, yeah. you know, designs to take over the region. And that that just, it, it disguises and obscures all the important detail of just what motivates the Iranians and what they really are looking for, which is mainly security, you know, going back to my comments about things like the Iran-Iraq war. And so we, we need to have a little more detail and patience to try to understand what is truly an adversary, but but one that is not as the simplistic devil that it uh, uh, continually gets portrayed as. And my last thought is just uh, to thank the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh for enabling us to share this time with the members and certainly thank my two very expert uh, uh, co-panelists for all of their contributions. Well said. So Roxanne, who's going to be the next president? I, uh, I have to tell you, I, I've had access to some uh, polling information that suggests Ibrahim Raisi, the head of the judiciary, who ran unsuccessfully for president in 2017, uh, is actually rising in popularity in Iran. Do you think we'll see him come back or one of these IRGC uh, figures that's already thrown their uh, military cap into the, the ring? Well, it, as an academic, it's not my business to forecast, but I can certainly look at the uh, the various trend lines. And certainly, Raisi has run before. He wouldn't be our first uh, choice for those sitting outside Iran because he's rather humorless and very uh, stiff, and I don't think he's very creative. And I think what we really are hoping for is somebody that can really run with the times. And I and I must agree with Paul that one of the the real uh, damaging elements of the um, of the Trump withdrawal was that it undercut the reformists, and this was their opportunity, I think, to make their case that a a an arrangement with the uh, West and with the United States could serve the country. It could deliver greater security. It could deliver greater business, and. Security is an interesting one because I think Iran actually would prefer having a somewhat more conventional uh, military uh, posture. It's just simply not been able to put one together under sanctions. And so I think that, you know, there's a lot of different elements to this. But back to your question. Um, Barbara, I do think it's going to be a conservative as a result. I think the reformists have simply lost credibility. 
But I think it's very possibly going to be one that is able to cross a number of different uh, uh, platforms. So one that d is well positioned with the uh, Islamic Re um, Revolutionary Guards, but one that has actually served in government and possibly uh, one that gets along with several of the different parties. And there are a couple of-, of Larry of, Johnny, uh, maybe. Larajani is one, Dehrani is another. There, there are some more moderate conservatives and, uh, and their experience. So I think if we're lucky, uh, somebody like Raisi won't be able to convince the electorate and that we will instead get somebody who can actually represent a number of groups. And this will be the first time for a number of things. One, that the parliament and the president will be from the same party group for a long time. So there will be a consistency. And it will be the first time in many years where the new president uh, of Iran will coincide with a new president in the United States. So I think that there may be some opportunity to establish a more personal relationship uh, going forward. Well, that is a fantastic way to end. So let me also thank my co-panelists and the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh for uh, this great conversation and turn it back to Joe. Thank you so much. It really was a, a wonderful conversation and we appreciate your time here with us. Um, so thank you, Roxanne, Paul and Barbara. Um, and um, we hope uh, someday in the future we can, we can have an update from you as well. Um, but for, for everyone in the audience as well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we ask that you please check out our virtual feedback wall that Olivia will link in the chat. Um, it's for you to share your experience of the virtual summit with our hardworking council team. Uh, we will constantly be viewing it to make improvements and, and take note of what you're enjoying. So please post. Um, and as the wall fills up, we'll create more space. So we hope you continue the discussion throughout the rest of our Redefining Global Learning Summit. And we invite you to join us tomorrow for the last day of events. We will be diving into emergent learning and creative facilitation. Click on the, the summit webpage in the chat to learn more about the fun things we have in store and to sign up. So, so once again, thank you all. And here's to meaningful engagement with lots of redefined learning. So take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it. Take care, Roxanne. Take care, Paul. Yeah, thank you, panelists. Fabulous conversation. See you guys. Appreciate it.